Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 817. I still sort of have a voice partway through Comic-Con, uh, which is very exciting. Probably be gone by tomorrow, though. Uh, this episode brought to you by Squarespace.com. You probably want to build some high-quality website or blog or a, or, a, or a store, a digital store, because it's very hard to build one um, using materials in, in the real world. So Squarespace will help you with that. Uh, start your free trial today. Go to squarespace.com, enter the offer code NERDIST to get 10% off your first purchase. And uh, we'll talk about more about that in a second. But uh, I would like to go to the NERDIST Community Cork Board. NERDIST Community Cork Board. Our NERDIST activity is happening possibly by you in the NERDIST community or someone near you or someone near that person. I'm very excited that uh, Leonard Malton has joined the NERDIST network he, uh, Malton on Movies is his new podcast. Uh, it's hosted by, of course, Leonard Malton, who you know. Uh, if you are of my, my generation, uh, you adore Leonard Malton. If you are um, one of the millennial generations, you probably know Leonard Malton because of Doug Benson. So uh, he's a film critic, a great guy, and he talks about new movies, his favorite movies, interviews actors, writers, and more. Episodes are every Friday, so thanks to Leonard Malton for joining the Nerdist Podcast Network. This episode is Butch Vig. Butch is a uh, is a legendary, legendary producer, music producer, and uh, he's also in the band Garbage, which uh, I was very, I I was so on the Garbage train. I worked at K Rock when Garbage came out, and and I I pulled Garbage and played Garbage every chance I could. And then Shirley Mansell was on the podcast last last year. And, uh, and fell more in love with her. So Butch, uh, it was fantastic and had some really great stories. And he is promoting uh, their latest album, Strange Little Birds. So please pick that up uh, and support talented, nice people. Uh, as I said, squarespace.com, powering the Nerdist podcast this episode. And uh, if you need a landing page or a gallery or a blog, it's it's really easy. I mean, they, they have fantastic support any level of programmer, I mean, you don't have to have any experience and, you know, you can just sort of drag and drop stuff and build a page and they'll help you if you need it. Or if you're a more advanced programmer, then you can get in there and 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 tweak the matrix code uh, if you want to. But it's very seamless and it it's exactly what you need to present whatever it is that you want to show to the world, whether it's for commercial purposes or personal purposes or you just want to put up pretty things. Uh, Squarespace.com is exactly what you need. Use the offer code NERDIST. Get 10% off your first purchase. Uh, Squarespace, set your website apart. Thanks to them for sponsoring this episode. Uh, this is Butch Vig here on the Nerdist Podcast, episode number 817. Katie, roll the thing. I can only get that low when my voice is chewed up from shouting at Comic-Con panels and parties. Now entering Nerdist.com Someone from Disney was like, here, Chris. Uh, no, but if anyone from Disney wants to send me original cells from classic Disney films, I'll take them. All right, you're on the record. Great. Do you collect anything? Not really. Um, I just, no, not really. <laughs> do, you really have... do you live small? Like, do you, is it like, do you not like clutter? Uh, you know, I sort of do. I'm kind of a pack rat. My wife, though, just kind of freaks out when stuff is around, so she's always like, Putting stuff in closets and yep. you know moving them out of the way. I I, I have a lot of uh, uh, music sort of memorabilia, but photos and things like that. And Packers, I'm a big, big Packers fan. Oh, okay, you know? gotcha. So I listened to the uh, Aaron Rodgers podcast. He's the man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, uh, with he did Pete, he did Pete's show, right? Yeah, yeah. He was that was Aaron's such a nice guy. Yeah, I'm not a sports guy, and uh, he's not at all. And the first time I met him. Uh, I'm like I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm not a sports guy and he was like no no that's fine like because I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna like pin him down and be like hey how come in the game against who do they play against man uh, well the Lions game was a very you know great drive last year you know in the last seconds like I thought the game was over and then he goes and just drops bombs on him. 
Yeah, he had Isn't two two, two Hail Marys last two year. Crazy, Most quarterbacks yeah. don't get one of those ever in the history of their career. And he got two in the same game. No, not in the same in game. The same year, the but same one was in the playoffs against the Cardinals, but everyone forgets that because the Cardinals won that game. If I remember, yeah, correctly. yeah, Cardinals won. Yeah. Like the next play, they threw a like six so they didn't pass give or something. Credit. They were like, here's another bomb. But like when you're watching Aaron Rodgers throw that ball, you're like, oh, he's gonna do it. He's gonna do it. I'm a Patriots fan, so I get it. I get what it's like to have a uh, supporter. Patriots fan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel like you guys need to have like some really intense debate about your teams uh, with insights. Well, I have no ill feelings towards the Green Bay Packers. It's not like they're like what kind Giants of a sports fan are the you? Jets. If you can't, well, we rarely some... see each other. You oh. know, except in the uh, Super Bowl in '96, where Brett Favre should have won and won, so it was fine. That's was true. Like, yeah. yeah, I get it. Parcells was the coach. Bill, there, right? yeah. yeah, Bill Parcells. Big fish. What is it that you like about the Pat? Well, I know you're from Wisconsin. It's in my DNA. You know, I had no choice. You know, <laughs> when you're, and, I, and the town I grew up in, a uh, very small town in western Wisconsin, Viroqua, on Sundays you could rob any building you want. You know, it's like everybody is glued <laughs> at, at, at kickoff at noon, and everyone's glued in front of the TV watching the Pack play. So you know that. I'm sure you've been to Mars Cheese Castle oh, yeah. enough times. Yeah. Oh, hang on. What? There's there's what's Oscar Mayer there's the Wiener Mobile you know that's that's a famous Wisconsin. Wait, Matt just said what's Mars know, Cheese Castle? I don't know what's castle. the Cheese Castle is. Mars Explain Cheese. Explain this to me because I love castles and cheese. It's a big. Uh, it, it's it's in between. Um, uh, I feel like I was out. Is it outside of Kenosha? Well, there, if you go on the strip between like Milwaukee and Chicago, it's just a strip. There's all these like burger joints. Yeah. But my favorite personally is White Castle. Oh, you like White Castle? Uh, White Castle. Uh, you like White Castle? That's my jam. Yeah. Yeah. Mars Cheese like Castle. Like a tiny, like a tiny a big, burger. It's just a big onions. cheese place. It's just like yeah. there's a lot of cheese. They have a lot of cheese. Well, I look forward to visiting it someday. Yeah. <laughs> you will go there yeah. sometime. I look forward to it. I really like Wisconsin. It's it's one of those places where when I, I'll visit when the weather is is kind. And I'll go, I totally understand why people would live here. And then I, but then a lot of the time. You also visit in like February. Yeah, yeah. And then I realize like, oh yeah, I would never survive. It's cold, man. Yeah, kind is mid-April to around Halloween or so. And then it starts to get nasty cold. Yeah. Did you, do you ever envision yourself moving back to Wisconsin? You know, possibly. I love going back there. My dad still lives in the house I grew up in. He's 93. Lives by himself. Uh, in Viroqua, and my brother and sister, and I have a ton of friends who all live in Madison. I kind of call it my hometown in a way because I spent many years there. Yeah. And le- we go back uh, usually once in the summer, my wife and my daughter and I, and uh, it's sometimes in the winter, but not Madison. always, not always <laughs> in the winter. Madison's a good, Madison and Milwaukee are fun towns to perform in. Like, those are good, and I think because people, it's a culture of understanding how to be indoors in a responsible way because for most of the year you have to be indoors. So I feel like people really they go to shows, they pay attention, they get involved. Like it feel it feels like a good you must have performed in Madison. Oh god, yeah. I mean, I know every gin joint, <laughs> uh, cafe, bar, club, tavern, roadhouse uh, through the state, you know. I played in bands in high school and college and this is before garbage, but um I played them all, you know. But cut my teeth in some pretty funky places there. Was it did you did you enjoy kind of going behind the scenes to produce or did the whole time you were producing you were like I really want to be playing more. This is like like you're basically making stuff for other people. Is that how do you kind of how do you separate yourself emotionally and go okay, I can make this for them, but I still have a piece of creative stuff for me. You know, I was always in bands before I became a producer and even when I got successful, I still liked that sort of uh camaraderie the clicky mm-hmm. thing of, of hanging with your bandmates yeah. it's just a it's a thing and um i you know i've been working with duke from garbage we were in bands in college and uh you know for 30 plus years and um i, I like it i like that uh that band mentality us against the world you know we're, yeah. we're i'm very close with my bandmates in garbage i think that's one of the reasons that we're still together after 20 years you gotta like hanging with the people you're making music with that's so crazy that you guys have been together 20 years. That's so weird. Because I worked at K-Rock when you guys formed. And I remember, wow. I remember, I think Queer was the first track off that album, right? And then Stupid Girl was this, the one that blew everything wide open. I think people really liked Queer and then Stupid Girl. I remember just being in heavy rotation at K-Rock. If you played a song twice on your shift... That means that Weatherly was way, was way, way, way into it. Now, right on. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, K Rock. That we that was uh, 
the first one of the first stations that played any tracks by Garbage. We weren't even done with the record. And uh, our manager now, Paul Kremen, was uh, working for Elmo, which w- was going through Geffen Universal. And we got this excited call, K-Rock's playing Garbage, you got to finish the damn record, finish the damn record. <laughs> we were just sitting around in Wisconsin drinking beer going, eh, we should finish this mix, get this track done. Because we had no plans, you know, there was no, we weren't going to tour. I was going to just go back to producing. So it was uh, just a passion project. Kind of. And when we started, it was just, we were doing it for fun, really. Was it like your traveling Wilburys? You're like, eh, here, we'll just do this and then put Sort it of, yeah. yeah. You know, Shirley was the the least likely inclined to tour because she didn't really know Duke and Steve and me. Yeah. She was like, I don't want to get on stage with you guys. That would just be <laughs> weird. <laughs> now she is the ultimate road dog. Yes. She's the road dog in the band. She was on last year. She was on our show. She's fantastic. She's she's the MVP of garbage. I mean, she's a great singer and a great uh, front person. She's really charismatic and uh, she's a road dog. Now I can already. It already seems like in just the couple minutes that I've been talking to you, I get the sense you're just a nice, laid back Wisconsin guy. And is that a necessary temperament to have when you are working with bands where there might be? I'm going to say some strong personality types and strong and strong opinions. Well, a lot of artists can be somewhat dysfunctional mm-hmm. from time to time, and I think that's part of what makes them creative in a way. They don't necessarily know how to deal with the real world sometimes. Um, but at least that's how I work. I, I try to stay pretty chill and um, and not get too. Um, I don't even know what the right term is. Don't get too aggressive with bands. I like them to let their guard down mm-hmm. and uh, and sort of forget that I'm there almost. And it seems to work. You know, every now and then I'll throw a chair or smash a phone. <laughs> or, I've done it not very many times when I when I really get pushed over the edge, and then then people are scared. I think when they see me go psycho, it's only happened about it maybe a half dozen times and. Well, I mean, years. But sometimes like, oh, you gotta go psycho. What, <laughs> what 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 kind of a situation makes you go psycho? Is it if 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 something isn't being played right, or if if someone's just being a dick? Uh, more if they're just being a dick. You know, if they're if they're having a hard time playing something, you just gotta work it out. You just keep either take a break and come back to it, or suggest a different way to play or perform. Um, usually, it's when someone's being a dick that. Uh, then you, sometimes you got to put your foot down. Absolutely. How much of how much of your how much of the albums you produce do you feel like are do you feel like these are my albums or that's that band's album and I just kind of helped it along? You know, I really have to remember when I'm producing someone, it's their album and it's their vision, and it's my job to help them get to their vision. You know, in garbage, it's my band, and I get to write songs with my bandmates, and it's a whole different kind of uh, mind space in a way, but. When I'm producing, I have to um, constantly be aware. It's I have to do the best thing for the band, make make smart decisions. And how do you get people to open up who might not, as you said, necessarily have a, a realistic outlook of the real world? And like, how how do you is is every person a little bit different? Do you have to spend time with them to kind of crack them open, or is it just we just start working together and then you figure it out? Usually, that comes after spending some time together, so they chill a little bit yeah. you know um and usually i will do that there's a process where uh, i'll try to hang with them you know listening to songs before we go in the studio going out to dinner starting to communicate about books movies like just so you get get to understand someone better and um and then uh, it's weird you go into a room and um it's a it's close quarters and it can get really intense you know so uh, the best thing, at least for me, is to to get the artist to just sort of forget I'm there, you know, whatever that takes to to keep them relaxed. It kind of seems like um, that era of that Nevermind sort of ushered in that era, that era of you know it was around the same time. I remember I bought Pearl Jam's Ten, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what it was because it was so close to the '80s at that point. And they, you know, like I didn't, re- I didn't know what all the flannel was. You know, this is a relatively <laughs> pre-internet era for everyone. So I was like, "What is this? Is this like a weird?" I, I just didn't. And then I heard it, and I was like, "Well, this doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard before." And then, uh, and then of course, Nirvana comes around, and then it's a complete new era. 
And also the beginning of the end of the old music business days. Were you sensing that at the time? You know, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to know where things are going. Um, I, you know, was producing all these uh, punk rock bands in in Madison at, at my studio, Smart Studios, and that led to working with bands like Smashing Pumpkins and Nirvana. And honestly, we felt like we were sort of underground still. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, uh, Nevermind just kind of took off, uh, went insanely crazy. And no one really saw that coming, but looking back now... Um, I think it's one of those records that really the timing was kind of perfect because coming out of the 80s, there was a lot of really kind of slick music on the radio like Madonna and CNC Music Factory. I think Michael Jackson was number one, and Nirvana kicked him out of the number one slot at the time. So um, there's something about that record, about Nevermind, that really spoke to people. It felt real, I think, and, and quite visceral. And, um, and it spoke to a whole generation of kids who I think were not getting that of what they were hearing on Top 40 Music at the time. And do you feel like it, all that stuff was real? Or do you feel like, no, we just swapped uh, big hair and leather stretch pants for flannel and chain wallets? Well, some people would argue your point there, Chris. Uh, music always goes in cycles. And something will get popular. And then the labels always jump on everything they can find, mm -hmm. whether it's hair metal bands and they got kicked out. And then... Uh, alternative music or grunge or whatever you want to call it became very popular and then that started to slip away a little bit and hip-hop had a big boom in the 90s and right, right now you see EDM electronica yeah. you know, uh, dance music is uh, massive and that'll become passe at some point it, every, everything just you know changes people's tastes change yeah I mean it's it is pretty remarkable though that it, you know when you say oh you know garbage started 20 years ago but even going back further it's still weird to me that like 1991-92 was 25 like that's a, that's a difficult number for me to wrap my head around that Just now a quarter century Chris. <laughs> now I think I you know like you, Yeah, it is. You hear you hear some of those you know you hear some of the early 90s stuff like on oldie stations like it's not old. Oh fuck yeah. Like when I in the 80s, you know, like you'd hear 60s on the station. That's the same it's the same delineation of time. I mean, does it does it feel like so far long ago, or does it feel like oh my god, that just happened? What that was twenty five years ago? Yeah, both really. Um, I guess because I'm still just really involved in music, and some of the people who I've made music, uh, garbage, and also Dave Grohl, I've worked with very closely. You know, I made Nevermind with them almost twenty five years ago, and I'm really good friends with them. And so the the music, um, it's some in a way, it's less about the music and more about just relationships. You know, I have with people. I mean, does it feel like uh, when you were younger, did you always say like, yeah, man, once I hit 40, I'm going to quit this shit, <laughs> you know, when you're like 20, 22 years old, like when I hit 40, it's all, and you get to 40, and you're like, hey, okay, there's not that, come on, it's not that crazy, it's not that old. I mean, do you ever, do you ever, did you ever think that when you were younger? Or did you think you'd be doing this forever? I guess I never really thought about it either way, but I don't have any hobbies. When you asked me when I came in, <laughs> do you uh, collect anything? I went, mm, no, I'm sad to say I, I don't really I collect guitars? anything. No, not really. I've, I have a few guitars at home, and I have a couple nice drum kits. I I, I have some nice microphones, but there you go. really, maybe about 20. <laughs> you know? but you 20 use microphones. I have like you know, 20, though, 25 microphones. But you can use those for your work, so I don't know if I that do really use them for work. So that's not a hobby then. Like, a hobby is just the thing that, you know. Yeah, like but he's really into microphones. See, he's a dork. What's your favorite microphone? Well, it depends on what you're recording. I want a mic a drum um, kit. Let's say I want a mic a floor tom. What do you want? What am I going to use? You know, a, a good utility mic for pretty much everything is the Shure SM7. SM7, yeah. SM7 not the ah. 57. The SM7's got, got the wider barrel on it. Uh -huh. You know, you see them a lot of times in um, in radio stations, whatever. You can put on a kick drum on a guitar. You can do, uh, do vocals with it. They work pretty damn well. That's your Swiss you can Army kick knife. it and drop it on the floor, and it's going to work. You know, it's it's pretty solid. Nice. It's a tank. It's a tank it's of microphones. A tank, but it sounds good. <laughs> how far into the how far into the process do you get? I mean, like, do you do you know? So when you you're producing Nevermind and you sit down with the band and they go, well, this is what we want to do, and you go, okay, I want to help you try to realize that. Do you it, does the vision carry through pretty much all the way through, or how flexible do you have to be throughout the process to go? I know we started here, but maybe we should do this instead. You know. That happens on every record I do. I get in my head an idea of where it's going to go and what it's going to sound like, and that always changes. And 
kind of changes almost every day I walk into a studio. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I'm still doing it. You know, rather than retire at 40, I still like to go in the, into the studio every day because it, you never know what's going to happen really. Yeah. Did you ever want to be a front? Did you ever want to be a frontman? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked being on the drum kit. You know, <laughs> why is that? Kind of in the background, kind of keeping it together, help, helping glue it together a little bit. There was not, where, where is the Phil Collins <laughs> story in, well, the, in I the life of Butch Vig? I can't sing very well for one thing. Um, all right, where's your Ringo story? <laughs> yeah, well, God bless Ringo, man. You know, they, I was just reading about that the other day. He had some quote. Uh, you know, they always gave him one song to sing on every yeah, record. Right. I think that's really cool that they did that. Yeah. Well, we've got to get a song for Ringo on this album. <laughs> what should we write today? How about, hmm, Yellow Submarine? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, then they all agree, and then John insults him a lot, and then... Uh, and then nah, I don't think it was like that. You don't think so? No. I think they loved Ringo. They I really do. Him. Yeah, yeah, I agree. yeah. But didn't John say he's not even the best? No, that's an inaccurate quote. Oh. That's a, that's a that's not a real quote. Apocrypha. Ringo, you know, Ringo is a badass drummer. He was oh, not as great. flamboyant as someone like Keith Moon or... Um, I to, John Bonham, but he's just an amazing. If you really drummer. want to get an idea of how good Ringo is, I highly recommend if you can still, if it's not copyright blocked on YouTube now, if you can go back and listen to like "Please Please Me" recorded with Pete Best, and then you can listen to it recorded with Ringo, and that's when the light goes off, and you're like, "Oh, Ringo's so much better." And Ringo always would the backbeat thing, like he just he would wait to the last possible millisecond and, and then was, it oh. came in yeah yeah and he was he was so oh, ringo's so good what makes a good drummer well there's so many different styles of uh drumming uh i mean for me personally because i'm kind of a song guy it's always uh, have, the drums need to work in the context of all the other musicians you know fills can be a hook mm. the groove has to be solid uh, you know if you're a jazz drummer that's a whole different thing or a, a funk drummer that's that's different but uh there's so many good drummers out there. Dave Grohl's a pretty good drummer. He's a pretty good drummer. Pretty good drummer. You know, and he doesn't fun. even play drums in his band anymore. <laughs> yeah, he, he fucking plays everything. Taylor Hawkins is a pretty badass drummer. Taylor is great. I mean, you know, he's great on the Atlantis Morissette record. And then, he ends and up then on, Dave yeah. stole them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dave's like, oh, I like those drums. <laughs> <laughs> and that worked out all right. Yeah. yeah. Dave and Taylor are thick as thieves. They're, they're, they're best buds. Yeah. Do you have any uh, good college when you were in college, and it was all punk music? I assume you're playing punk. A lot music. of lot of punk rock, yeah. Did you ever think, well, where's this going to go? Are we just going to be punk bands? For like, what was your what's what's kind of one of your favorite moments from your band in college? Well, we Duke and I were in a band uh, called Spooner, and we were sort of a new wave. Uh, slightly punky, slightly new wave, and slightly sort of Tom Petty Americana all rolled into one, if that makes any sense. Um, and I remember we had uh, an offer. We put out an EP in our own label, Boat Records. It was just a Madison label that we put a bunch of other Madison bands out on. And uh, we, we got some attention in the Midwest, and we got a call. Clive Davis oh, wanted, shit. wanted to come and see us. And we're like, oh my God, Clive Davis? Holy shit. And he said he wants to see you like next weekend and we're like uh okay we didn't have anything booked so we scrambled around we called up a club owner in chicago and um and we drove down that saturday to play and we t t called some friends there was no advertising for it and it's a really weird day because uh, our manager bob picked clive up at o'hare airport <laughs> He was so nervous, he forgot to turn his handbrake off. <laughs> and the car started on fire on the interstate between, oh, this is for a real story, God. between O'Hare and the club. Meanwhile, at the club, you know, we just had a handful of our friends show up, and, and the guy, the stage manager said, you know, I'm really sorry, but we just got a court order. This guy who lives across the street is pissed off. His CB radio plays through the PA. <laughs> And we hear this, and, and, and so we had my friend Pete Love, who was sort of our tour manager for many years. He went over and I said, just keep talking to the guy. Don't let him go upstairs and talk on the CB radio. Just talk to him for like two hours while we try and do a little 40-minute set for Clive. And we were scared shitless. And, and it was literally Clive and his A&R guy sitting right where you are sitting right now, like four oh, feet away. God. And we played like 10 songs. And then... 
you know, there was a few of our friends clapping like this. And then we went and sat down with Clive. And he said, I really like this music quite a bit. Um, uh, you know, I think I, I want to just get you in the studio with a producer. Uh, his name is Robert. And uh, I think let's just, let's just cut a couple tracks and see where it goes. So we were really excited. Yeah. After he left, our, our attorney said, you know what? You can do better than just a single deal. I think we should hold out. Let's see if we can get an album, a one or two album deal. And it fell apart. The whole deal fell apart. We started talking to Capital and Electra and Arista and Columbia. The deal fell apart. And um, it, whatever. Uh, we ended up having to do it ourselves, um, boat records, and I learned that's how I learned to produce records. It turns out the producer, Robert was Mutt Lang. <laughs> Robert John Lang. That's who That's who he wanted to put us in the studio with. Now, here's what would have happened. Either I would have absorbed everything and probably be a better producer than I am now, or he would have kicked my ass and I would have quit the music business forever. <laughs> but you'll never know. I'll never know. It all, yeah. out, it all worked out great. It all worked out in the end, yeah. But that's what's so great is it, it's like that's, that's almost like a Forrest Gump moment where you're like, oh, you were right there at that weird, just that, that little It was a really moment. weird, super weird night, super weird night. <laughs> and did were you guys, uh, I mean, because the, the legal process – can kill mo- a lot of things. Like the legal process is like you, you get all excited about the creative process and it's like, okay, here come the lawyers and now this just all, all the fun's going to get squeezed out because they have to, you know, come up with the 50 million different horrible things that could happen and who owns what. And, and so, how, you know, are, are you good at kind of keeping your <laughs> enthusiasm for the business part while you're trying to keep the creative part going? Yeah, you sort of ignore the business part every now and then you have to put that on your head that sort of compartmentalize a little bit and just go okay we got to deal with this aspect of it and then just put it put it aside you know so it doesn't get in the way of um you know your art or or making creative decisions and sometimes i have to tell artists that too like don't schedule a meeting with your manager you know half hour before you're going to do vocals yeah. Just oh, don't a, do it. That's you know? a great idea. Just don't do it. That's a great idea because you're going to get in your head. You're going to get cranky. You're, you're going to get, weird. yeah, it's, it's just going to bum you out. When you're there was another band. <laughs> I, 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 should, I can't name names, but another band um, who I worked with, uh, they called their manager the Vibe Crusher. <laughs> 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 and, and I'd go, dude, the Vibe Crusher's coming by the studio. I'd go, really? Does he have to come by? Oh, man. <laughs> this is a long time ago. And uh, I don't really even know if he works in the business anymore. I think he was such a Vibe Crusher that he kind of got kind of got forced you don't up. want that it, that you don't want that to be your brand as a manager <laughs> now he's of, crushing vibes at his local starbucks yeah so anyway so. uh but that yeah dude the vibe crusher's coming by <laughs> how do they how do they different how do the different artists work that you've that you've worked with between billy corrigan and you know like dave and and those guys and like is it does it kind of feel like oh they're all part of the same cut from the same cloth or is it is it really everyone is so unique that you have to figure out how to kind of navigate each situation? Everybody's pretty unique in their own way. How they get motivated, how they go through a writing process and recording process. Um, in some instances, it's uh, easier. Um, in some instances, it's uh, kind of like pulling teeth, you know, sometimes to really draw performances out and get people to relax. Um, it, it really depends. Sometimes it, it's also, it varies from song to song, you know, with an artist. Some songs come really easy and some come really, really hard and, uh, and they're a struggle. And you never know. Again, that's why I said earlier when you go in the studio, I think in my head, here's what we're going to do today. And then usually th- that doesn't always happen exactly like I think it's going to. Have you been completely surprised by something that you thought, well, I, I guess we gave this the old college try, and then all of a sudden that thing becomes huge? Um, yeah, I mean, s- some songs, uh, uh, you're almost ready to throw in the towel, and then you figure out something to do. Sometimes it's walking away and taking a U-turn, trying to figure out something to salvage it. Um, working with the Pumpkins on Siamese Dream, we deliberately kept pushing the song Disarm to the back burner because it didn't sound good. And the reason it sounded shitty was because the band was playing live. They were in the big tracking room in Atlanta, and they kept cutting with live drums, bass, guitars, like like we cut it the rest of the record. And 
never sounded right. And I just kept putting it, putting aside Billy, say, let's cut this arm today. Go, no, let's do, we got, let's do Soma. We got to finish. You know, we kind of know where that is. It was the last song we tracked, I think. And, um, you know, the band was in recording it and it, it just sounded terrible. And I didn't really know what to do. And, and out of frustration, um, Billy Corgan walked out of the studio into the control room and just sat on the couch and started playing the acoustic guitar. And, and I just went, that's how it has to sound. Hmm. And very quickly, we recorded Billy with just a mic sitting on the couch and told everybody to stay out of the control room for like half an hour. And then we just built the whole song up. And rather than do it as more as a rock song, we did it more orchestrally and added uh, some a little bit of piano and some percussion and strings and things. And uh, and to me, it sort of made the song a thousand times more emotional than, than we were yeah. tracking it as a, as a live band. Huh. Wow, so you really do... Ha- you, I mean, it... There's such a lesson about like being inflexible and kind of being like, no, this all has to be this thing. All the songs have to be this. Of being able to take a step back and saying, hey, you know, we can experiment or we can try. Like, what do, what do you think is the weirdest thing that you've ever tried in a in a in a session? Putting a microphone into a bucket of sand. <laughs> <laughs> For... It did not sound very good. Oh, that's interesting. I would have thought. <laughs> into a of that was for a garbage session. We were trying to get a really strange filtered sound directly from the mic, and uh, I don't remember why. We did. I think some beer had been consumed that mm-hmm. night. Sure, sure. And uh, like on many garbage sessions, especially the early that first record, a lot of beer was consumed. <laughs> And I don't know why. We wanted it to sound sort of distant, and we thought the sand would filter the microphone to a certain extent, but it sounded terrible. It sounded like a microphone at sand. And it's stuck into a bucket of sand, yeah. Is it harder to produce your own stuff because you're emo- you're, it's you? Is it harder to separate yourself as a producer from, uh, from a performer, or, or do you find that easier than producing other people? I kind of find it harder in a way uh, because with garbage it's multi-layer like i can bring in a song idea i can play drums or guitar or bass i can help arrange uh, uh i can make production decisions all four of us share uh the same role so pre- pretty much all the time and we argue a lot um sometimes you know i'm not quite sure where uh, a song should go you know who's really i think is the kind of the best litmus test in the band is surely i think she seems to if we're struggling she usually will say one or two things to me or the rest of the band will go oh and a light bulb will go off one of the songs on the new record um on strange little birds uh is called even though our love is doomed and i came up with that title you know, riding in a car i come up with a lot of music ideas in my car in la because you're in your car a lot, a lot in la you know yeah and uh, so I'll hold up my phone. Do you have and no radio on? What do you do? You I do. I listen to the radio, uh, and I listen to podcasts. Um, yeah. I'll download them on my phone and listen to them. I don't listen to that, not as much commercial radio as, as yeah. I do, more like internet stuff. But um, I, So I came up with this title, and I, I just sort of sang the the melody line to it, and I didn't really know what to do with it. And I, I emailed Shirley that, and I got home late that night, and I said, I have this song idea, even though our love is doomed. She goes, oh, I love the title. I love it. It's gothy and weird and it's like weathering heights and yeah. whatever and so i was encouraged by that and then over the course of a couple months i tried to write some demos just to bring into the band and i made one that was sort of electro dancey one that was sort of punk rocky one that sort of had more almost folky guitars um and none of them sounded very good and, uh, and then I changed the tempo, made it into more of a swing groove, almost like a that kind of thing. That didn't sound good. So I just let it fall by the wayside. And Cheryl asked me a, a couple months later, uh, what happened to that song, Even Though Our Love Is Doomed? I, I really love that title. And I said, I've made three or four demos and they all suck. <laughs> and she said, just record something really simple. And all I had was those the lines on the chorus, a couple of lyrics on the chorus. And so I panicked. The next day I went down to my home studio, I picked up the bass, and I wrote this bass line, thinking I have to have at least an intro or some other chords to the song. And I wrote all the lyrics in five minutes. <laughs> and I left it really spare, and I took it in, and Shirley listened to it and went, I love it. And she sang it once, and that's what you hear in the record. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. Yeah, a so, wonder? So I so I made that demo in the morning, took it in. She heard it once and sang it once, and it was kind of done. 
after struggling for two months trying to figure out how to record the song, you know, what it should sound like. So, but that's also a good lesson in, you know, maybe when you are trying to make something work, walking away and then coming back, you you know, you have a different perspective by that time. You can go back and you have a different view on uh, on what it is that you were trying to do. Or maybe you just needed to live for two months before it made, <laughs> before it actually, before it made sense to you. Yeah, sometimes you got to go home. Just go, you know what? Let's call it a day. Turn the tape machines off. Turn the computers off. Go home, and uh, and then you wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and your brain will go, "Oh, this makes total sense." Here's what we need to do. You know, sometimes you just gotta get get away from it. Do you have days, do you have days in the studio where literally nothing gets recorded. Yeah, yeah. You have days where you record. The, the guitars all sound out of tune. Uh, the feel, whether it's with garbage or working with other bands, you know, you have off days, and it's hard hard, hard to uh, take those days because. Everybody always expects that you know we'll get something great yeah. today, and and it's frustrating when that happens. But you have you have to know when to just walk away, you know, and, how and do come you back. Press after those. <sighs> have a ice cold beer. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Right. Yeah, he's Wisconsin. It checks out, Chris. He's from yeah. Wisconsin. He's got a brew. He's, he, has a, <laughs> he's, he has a brat, and then uh, and then everything's fine. Yeah. Are you working on? Do you, do you like to work on a lot of different stuff at once, or do you need to just focus on one thing at a time? I'm kind of a f- one project at a time uh, type of person. Uh, I, I'm not. I can't. Like, I I love Rick Rubin's work, and he's sometimes is doing like five or six records at once, and he's able to do that. I I need to kind of focus on on one thing and just kind of immerse myself in it, and um, and then when it's done, I'll I'll jump into something else. Occasionally, I'll I'll, I'll work on other things at the same time but um I, I like that kind of tunnel vision in a way yeah i think i make better records for it are you good once a project is done to be really done with it or when you hear like if you listen to Nevermind now you're like fuck i should have <laughs> like or is it are you able to i want to go back and tweak those things i never quite nailed uh <laughs> yeah, so, some things it, it's hard uh <laughs> so, like only happy when it rains I never got that mix on that song. I know it was a big hit for us and, you know, whatever. But I, the, on the last day, we'd, we'd finished the record, and we were flying on a Monday morning to New York from Madison to master the record. And I went in on a Sunday night and recalled the, the track and tried to remix it again because I didn't like the way it sounded. And I just had to throw my hands in there and go, ah, I guess it's done. Yeah. What is it? What do, it, you, do you still hear it? Do you still go? Oh yeah, it doesn't sound. Does, the, the mix doesn't sound right to me. The balance of the guitars and the drums and and the, especially the end of the song, I didn't quite get how I heard it in my head. But if I t- gotta let it go, man. Tom, I was watching a Damn the Torpedoes documentary uh, about the mix, of, like that, the whole making of that record, and they, uh, Tom and uh, uh, Ivy, what the, uh, w- w- the producer, Jimmy Ivy, Jimmy Ivy, yeah, they kept trying to get that final mix right and they would they were like ah oh, it doesn't sound right and then they would fly to new york and go to a studio and try to mix it there they'd be like ah oh, it still doesn't sound right they'd fly to a different studio they went to four studios and they were finally like ah oh, whatever <laughs> well that, i love that documentary um, um i love tom petty too he's he's one of my oh, heroes I love tom petty too. you know there was always a lot of tension between uh, Tom and Stan Lynch, and I think Jimmy and Tom were never quite happy with uh, Stan Lynch's drumming. I thought he was an amazing drummer. I saw Tom play back in the day, and recently I've seen him play probably fifteen or twenty times, yeah. and and just love him. He's but, touring with Mudcrutch right now. Did you yeah, know that? I know that's, that's cool. Like crazy. <laughs> they, you know, when on, on "Damn the Torpedo," some of those songs they they tracked a hundred times. It's Jesus. crazy. It's crazy what they went. You know, trying out. to get the right feel, try whatever. I mean, right. even it's know, a great album. How do you? I know, yeah, but how, how do you yeah. even know at that point? It's like you know when you hear like Kubrick shot this scene two hundred. Like how do you yeah, even know yeah. at like one hundred and sixty takes? <laughs> like how can you even? How do you even know what reality is anymore at that point? In, in my experience, it's good to remember the first couple takes because usually there's something pretty magical with them. And what I find is when you do more takes, it spirals down for quite a while, and then it takes a long time to get back up to that to your A game. Mm. And then it can get really good again, but it's always this path, really good, really bad, and then you just got to wait it out till you get back to where it gets really good. And so that's why the first one, two, three, four takes, usually you should pay attention yeah. to those. God, but, the, but, but hearing about going to the different studios around the country and also thinking about that time in the music business where it was like, Ah, get a jet. We'll just, it's like, you know, there was, 
The, well, the, was, the, uh, that was the, that Dan Dan Peters was happening while the legal battle was happening, right, with the record company. No, that was or it was, was that? after Dan La Torpedoes, uh, but they may have the legal battle may have started because I remember I think weren't they hiding? The yeah, tapes they were hiding the stuff? tapes, so the record company couldn't <laughs> yeah, get them. So they were hiding the master in. tapes for Dan the Torpedoes. And, like, only one guy knew where the tapes were, and he never told anyone where the he, It was his job at the end of the night after they left the studio to take all the tapes, put them in a station wagon, and go hide them. Holy shit. <laughs> I just... I, it just seems like... If you were, it, it feels like the 70s and the 80s were probably a really fun time when, that, when it just seemed like this, this is a never-ending journey that we're on, and the music business is not going to change at all. We can, you know... They, they had open checkbooks back then, too, you know, just they would, yeah. oh, you need $100,000 for this? No problem. Right. You know, things have We're going to charge quite... this back to you, of course, but here, <laughs> yeah. you'll be indebted to us for life, but you don't know, worry yeah, about yeah. Fly out that hundred grand on our own jet. Here you go. <laughs> go <laughs> yeah. pick it up in Van Nuys. And we're going to charge you for the jet that we sent Also, to uh, gas is very expensive right now. Yeah. It's the 70s. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's something you in the back of your head as an artist, you go, oh, yeah, it's recoupable, but then you... Don't always remember everything's getting billed back to you, and then you look at the royalty statement when you're done yeah. after selling a million records, and there was no money. You know, and that happened to lots of artists. Yeah, because they just did. I mean, it. Well, just, you don't think about it. You don't think about it. It's like, oh, this it. is free money, and they're just giving us this to make this. Oh, this will be fine. I don't think anyone. I'm not sure anyone even really talked about it. I just remember that uh, was it a behind the music? I don't know. Yes, was it, it was the, the TLC the one. Was it was TLC? I think it was TLC. And I think it was, uh, I don't remember if it was Lisa, I don't know if it was Left Eye or Chili or one of them was like, so they, you know, they tell you you're going to get $100,000 for this thing. And then you, what you don't realize is, you know, this much goes to taxes, this much goes to other people, this much goes to the touring expenses, this much. And then you're, then you're left with nothing, you know, by the end of it. And it's a whole, you know, like it's a great way for a lot of other people other than the artists to actually make money. <laughs> that still is true today. Still yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah, especially I think you know the bigger, some of the bigger stars like in in R and B and hip hop. A lot of times there's multiple writers. There's a whole posse and entourage. They have you know they, there's a lot of things going on. You know a lot of younger bands now are getting smarter to that, and, and they can take care of a lot of things on their own, especially with the the internet and just they can do their own marketing. You know a, a really smart band now can record an amazing track and post it. Uh, you know, on their own, and it can go viral in 24 hours, and a million people can hear it. Yeah. And that, 20 years ago, had was necessary. Had to go through the gatekeepers, you know, the big labels for that. To happen. Well, when you were starting Wisconsin and you had your label, what was, how were you getting the music out? Was it just like touring and go and just doing local shows in the region? Yeah, we would we would hand stamp the the seven inch. You know, sometimes we would we'd get a bunch of beer, get our friends over, and we'd get a thousand singles, and we'd glue them and then we'd take them around to the local record stores in uh, Madison and in uh, Kenosha and Milwaukee and La Crosse and Eau Claire mm-hmm. and maybe we just every now and then drive down to Chicago and drop off some and that was it we were the the label and the distributor did you like that part of it I did for a while <laughs> 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 yeah it's fun you know when you're starting out it's just to be part of everything uh and you know it was a whole underground scene it was very um uh, very supportive, very community oriented. You know, a lot of bands help each other out. Um, they would, you know, you crash in people's couches and, you know, couldn't afford to stay in hotels. Or every now and then you get one room for the band and crew mm-hmm. and everybody would just so they had a shower, you know. Um, and it, it, but it was that you don't really care about um, when, you're, when you're young like that and making music, you don't really think that uh, when I grow up, is this what I'm going to do? You know, you're just in the moment kind of doing it and, and it's fun. Did you have any kind of existential crisis when, because you know, you're starting in punk bands and you're producing a lot of underground stuff, and then all of a sudden, you know, Siamese Dream does well and Nevermind does well, and all of a sudden, you're, then do you realize, like, oh, wait, now I am kind of a part of the machine, but I was rebellious before. Did that, does that ever, did, was there ever any kind of crisis of conscious with that, or did you, were you able to go, oh, no, but this is what I wanted? You know, I did that other stuff before because no one just, handed me a giant record deal in, in Wisconsin. Well, after the success of Nevermind, I got bombarded with managers and publishers and labels who thought I had some magic button I could push and, <laughs> and turn them into a famous grunge band. Uh, 
And it, it was quite ludicrous because I would get uh, folk singers or blues players and they just thought I could change them sonically and they would fit right in the current alternative movement. And I got offers to set up a studio in London and, and move to New York or L.A. And, and, you know, sign with big management companies. And I, I just I said no to all that. I decided I wanted to stay in in Madison because I felt like it would keep me grounded mm. and sort of not, I wouldn't really get caught up in whatever current trends were going on. And, and, uh, and plus I liked, I just liked it because we were so far, it was not easy to get to Madison. It was always two flights. You had to fly to Chicago and then jump in another, a smaller plane to Madison. So usually the vibe crushers didn't come to Madison, <laughs> you know, we were kind of left to our own devices and that was a good thing. Was there a was there a particular track on Nevermind that you thought that you really thought was gonna like did it did it all play out exactly the way that you thought it would? Did you ever have your George Martin moment where you took off your headphones and were like, boys, you got your first number one? <laughs> <laughs> I always assume that's what happens like with a hit record that they all just kind of sit back and crack their and go, We did it. I wish I had the wherewithal to understand that at the time. You know, it's a. Uh, uh, God bless George Martin. Uh, no, I, I had no idea. I knew Teen Spirit was a phenomenal song. It was the first song that the band played in rehearsals. Um, when I went to North, we had a couple of days of rehearsal in North Hollywood before we went into Sound City. And uh, that's when I first met Dave Grohl. And um, they played Teen Spirit, and it sounded phenomenal. It just blew my doors off. I remember pacing around the room going, oh, my God, this sounds incredible. Mm -hmm. And I looked at Dave's, I was watching Dave drum, because that's the first thing you got to worry about is, is the drummer good? Because that's the first thing you got to make sure you nail when you're tracking something. And um, it was so loud, and I realized he didn't have any mics on the drums. The, Chris had this giant bass rig, and, and, <laughs> and Kurt had a Mesa boogie that was just ear-shattering loud, and yet the drums were as loud as the guitar and the bass in, in the room. And, um, and Dave was so solid, and I just remember kind of sweating, and at the end I said, play it again. And then I started taking some notes. We, we, I had minimal work to do on the song. It was uh, We did a little bit of arranging on it. But He's such a kind powerful of, drummer. Dave is, he and the band so was hard. tight. You know, they, they spent six months pretty much rehearsing every day before we went in to, to cut Nevermind. So they were tight, and they were, they were focused. You know, co contrary to whatever... Everybody thinks they were slackers. That was not true. They they wanted to make a really good, really focused record. That's so fascinating that it's that even that part of the that aesthetic part of the culture, that aesthetic part of grunge. Because I always, I, it always seems like, fortunately or unfortunately, the the aesthetic quality kind of leads the. That's the thing that's in front, and then people, oh, the music too, you know. It's like you know, with hair metal, it was all the hair and the thing. With grunge, it was you know, people were seeing all the flannel, and that became that became the thing. And they're, they're really just, like, skins. They're just filters or costumes or whatever. It doesn't even really... It's all kind of the same thing from a certain point of view. But at least well, at Grunge, it made sense because all those clothes were comfortable. <laughs> they were comfortable. <laughs> you know, I, I if look in my wardrobe. I've got a couple flannel shirts still. I haven't worn them for a while. Oh, but, but you have a couple gas station shirts that say, like, <laughs> Clyde or whatever. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, Fred. I had one that said, a gray one that said Fred on it. <laughs> you, got, you got your Doc Martens in there somewhere. And... I'll tell you, though, there, for us and my, and my friends, it was because there was a St. Vinny de Paul. It's like um, two blocks from yeah. Smart Studio. Studios and would, they would, they would, you could get a couple of shirts for a dollar. It just so no one cared about yeah. buying nice clothes because nobody could afford them, you know. So and then within a couple of years, then they were it was, they were the most expensive clothes in the store. Were like the second hand, the second. Yeah, then, well, then designer grunge. Yeah, you go to Barney's, you could get a, a flannel <laughs> shirt for like four hundred dollars. <laughs> you ever? Yeah. If you're, in a, do you ever? Do you ever find yourself like in a Barney's and you see like three hundred dollars for a Nirvana shirt? Are you fucking kidding me? Like do. You, <laughs> Do you ever do you ever speak up? Do you ever want to speak up and go, "Come on, guys, let's"? No, no, no. You know, I, I, I remember uh, Billy Corgan used to make fun of me because I would wear either t-shirts or flannel shirts, and I started dressing it up with a black vest. Ah, nice. And that's because I wanted to set myself. Up. Okay, I'm the producer. I'm in charge here, guys. I'm going to class it up a little bit. I'm going to put on a vest today, and Billy still makes fun of me. For you need that. something with buttons. Yeah, I know, but, <laughs> but, but, Billy. And I and I'm a huge Smashing Pumpkins fan. Like, still regularly listen to the pump to Pumpkins stuff. But with Melancholy, he it, like I remember seeing him at the Video Music Awards that year. It was like, when did the Uncle Festering happen? Like, his head was shaved, and he was in this like gothic one piece like fester like robe. I mean, that was 
if anyone ever gives you shit about wearing a vest, you can be like, <laughs> yeah, but what about this period in your wardrobe? You know, I think he, like a lot of people, just was sort of looking at where music was going and realizing alternative styles or whatever were, were becoming passe. I and mean, I think he just wanted to... You know, it's show business. You just wanted to do something different. Do you think once they give up? Do you think once they put a, uh, once they give it a label, not a record label, but like once they give the movement a label, then it's kind of downhill from there. Like once they called it alternative, it's like, okay. This isn't really alternative anymore because it's all they're all hit songs. Yeah, sometimes I think that happens. You know, a lot of people think I'm from Seattle because, <laughs> and, and they, they would say, oh, you're a grunge producer, and, and I mean, I've done a lot of other music besides. Nirvana and the Pumpkins, and and I did a lot of punk rock and, and grungy sounding records, but I've done a lot of other things like that. So, I found it annoying at the time, especially when the first Garbage record came out, because we we made a record that sounded quite different than than everything that was on alternative radio, and we would do in, uh, some of the first interviews, and I could see the journalists sort of listening to Shirley and Duke and Steve and me answer our questions about Garbage, and then they would finally go, "Okay, what was it like working with Kurt Cobain? Right? What was it like working with Billy Corgan?" And I, at that time, I just said, mm, I don't really want to talk about that. You know, I'm not trying to be a dickhead about it, but I'm really kind of here to talk about garbage. And now, everybody just wants to talk to Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> but you, is Shirley around? <laughs> and and that's how it should be, you know? Yeah, there's always the, I mean, you know, ha, I feel like there's a, when you work with people that sort of become because I've worked with people before too that become like the face of something and then it's always like hey what was that like did you sleep with that person what's that what do they do and you're like I don't, I don't know. know what's that what do they do I mean seriously <laughs> yeah, no no yeah but I really it was Cameron Crowe I think that really kind of when, when the, that single soundtrack is still completely oh, right, holds right. up that was really kind of the that was sort of like I feel like the the kind of the major flags stick in the ground of this is a cultural movement that's that's happening you know that uh with that movie still holds up by the way speaking of cameron crow he's got a new show that i taped i haven't seen yet um roadies which looks oh yeah roadies oh, is right. gonna, yeah, and yeah. it looks quite i saw the trailer it looks quite funny it looks cool yeah do you what what kind of stuff do you like to watch what do you do you watch comedy or sci-fi uh or like... god i hardly get a chance to even watch much tv these days uh um, I, I watch a, a bunch of stuff that's um, HBO and Showtime. I think the, the programming's been really good. And Netflix is great. Uh, lately, I've just been burning through music documentaries. Right. And, uh, you know, just I, I sort of can't seem to get enough of them. You know, talking about the they Tom keep Petty. More. The Jaco Pastorian. Did you watch that, that just one? Came, I haven't seen it. And I've, I've had great. a couple of people write me and say it's fantastic. So I got, I'm going to check that out. It's on Netflix, right? Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite one? Oh, man. Um,. You know, I I love that Tom Petty, that four hour it's Tom so Petty good. documentary. I've watched, it, I, I've watched it. I've watched it like four dream. times. I watched it like four times. It's called Running Down a Dream. Yeah, Running Down a Dream. It's two Watch two it. two hour parts. You know what I also liked, um, and a lot of people kind of would diss me for this, but I like that Eagles documentary that came out. Oh so, yeah yeah yeah. Especially the first half where it's all this footage of them like playing with Linda Ronstadt and mm-hmm. their Glenn Fry's living in this apartment upstairs and here's Jackson Brown working on the same song Doctor in My Eyes like hundreds of times trying to figure out the second verse <laughs> and Glenn Fry's going hmm that's how you write songs you just keep working at it over and over and over and over again it was it's a pretty cool documentary holy shit I didn't see that one did you see that yeah it was on HBO came out what two years ago right the Eagles one yeah but that, I, I do highly recommend the Tom Petty one you know, I have been working with a director on a Smart Studios documentary. It's a oh, Smart cool. Studios story that's done. We're just trying to get the, all the music and licensing cleared. And I, it, when, when he started the film a couple years ago, and, um, well, she's been working on collecting archival stuff for like five or six years, uh, right around the, when Smart closed its doors. But it was great to go back, and that's when I started getting into all these documentaries because we were sort of trying to figure out the content and how, what kind of story you want to tell, what the narrative is going to be. And, uh, and Wendy's done a great job with it, but that's when I really started immersing myself into yeah. a, a documentary, especially on Netflix. Cause they have a lot of great, great documentaries. Are you watching there. to learn or are you just watching to relate a little bit to relate, but a lot of it is as a fan, you know, I, I kind of feel like every time I watch it, I find out something new about a band. Um, I just watched, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, the 
West End. Uh, it's a British band. And I, I didn't know anything about. Um, I'm totally brain dead right now. Um, they were a, a new romantic band. It's called like the West End Boys, and it's not about. Um, not about the Pet Shop. Boys? Not about the Pet Shop Boys. Oh, who is it? Oh, it'll come to me here, but it's, it's fantastic, and I didn't know of the Western world. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Katie, Google. Katie, Google. <laughs> British band, something, uh, something on the Western world. Uh, f- Google that. Google that shit. Western- Damn it, my brain. <laughs> come on, come on, brain. Western world. Western. They're a new romantic. Soul Boys. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you so much. Soul Boys, the Western <gasps> world, <gasps> and who is it about? Spandau. Well, that's about Spandau. Spandau Ballet. Spandau Ballet. And I only knew a couple of their hits. True and Gold. And, 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 and fantastic songs. And the documentary is amazing. And uh, I highly recommend it, even if you don't know anything about the band. It's just a really fascinating story. Like a lot of good documentaries, they usually take you on a, yeah. on a journey that sometimes goes into some dark places and very unexpected places. But they're, they're, they're really interesting to watch. Uh, is, there, is there one about the tubes? I'm kind of fascinated with the tubes. There should be, if there's not. If there is, I haven't seen that weren't one, Weren't they sort of like the... Weren't they almost kind of like a a, a parliament-style band where it was just like a fucking free-for-all? Like, anything could happen at one of their shows, and they had like these massive ensembles of people, and they were just these crazy costume fuck-arounds? Thinking of the Flaming Lips. I'm on the... <laughs> Definitely thinking of the yeah, tubes. They were, and they were badass players. You know, they I remember like with some of those uh, early singles they had too. That the the production and just the the chops, the the, the play and the dexterity of the musicians was was at a very very high level. Are you pretty open to all types of music, or are you snobby about? Or are you like, oh, but I won't listen to country. Like, are you? Is there? You're pretty much just all music. You know, I listen to so many different kinds of music, and I think I have to thank my mom for that. She was a music teacher, and growing up in Viroqua. On the radio, you heard country music and polka music. Yes! And my mom uh, played Nat King Cole and the Tijuana Brass, and she bought Beatles records and Stones records mm. and, um, and musicals. God, I, I've heard so many musicals. Every night at dinner, she'd put on, like, Camelot or West Side Story or something. <laughs> and she played piano and trumpet, so I was always sort of inundated with music. And she would hear some song and a melody, melody and just go, that melody is lovely. And I would think, it is lovely, and it could be some... <laughs> pop throwaway pop song or whatever you know she she just appreciated it for uh what it could be and, and i i feel the same way i i listen to, i listen to all different kinds of music please tell me that you've ever seen an episode of the big joe polka show <laughs> i have not what <laughs> oh my i'm gonna God. Ha- i'm gonna have That's to from your I'm gonna have region to, of the country i'm gonna have to check it out i don't know if it's still around katie see if big joe polka's a- i caught it i caught it years ago there was a channel card called RFD. It was like the Rural Farming District channel. So it was like during the day, there were a lot of like tractor auctions on this channel sure. and cattle auctions. Yeah. And they showed, is Big Joel Polka on there? Well, this is the host died this year. Oh, oh, oh bummer. Joel. The host would be Big Joe. Yeah. Big Joe died? Well, God damn it. In fairness, it was pretty big. And he was very, he was an older guy too. Yeah, I, I played in a, a polka band in college that was a, Cash gig, man, two hundred bucks every time I played. It was just me and a wow. bass player, Tom Lavarda, and Cliff Benz. Cliff Benz and the Poketeers, and he would call me for pickup for weddings or whatever parties and stuff. And we wore these red one size fits all red big frilly shirts with like big collars oh, and like yeah. droopy, uh, uh, droopy sleeves. Great for drumming. Great for drumming. I would just set out my kick snare. A hi hat. I had a little cowbell, and then on the floor, Tom, I could put my beer. <laughs> I really, you know, I knew some of the polkas, but there was a lot I didn't know. And Tom, like, seemed to know all of them. And Cliff would go, and here's our theme song, Musica, Musica. And every song, he would just nod at me. Was the end like? We ended every single song that way. So I could just check out the girls dancing. I could play with one hand like this, take a sip of beer. And I got paid 200 bucks. I loved it. It was cash, never reported it. You know, just like It's beers. such an interesting part of the culture, too, that polka culture. And if you're able to catch any of the – someone should do a documentary on that guy. But if you're ever able to catch any of the – they're on YouTube – but he did this show, and they would go to just these kind of like weird. It looked like they were at like a moose lodge in a lot of them, or just a weird kind of conference room that they converted. And it's a lot of older people dressed as 
polka as fuck. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. But the best part about it oh, is... Oh, check that out. That's fantastic. Everything from the waist up, like expressionless, like <laughs> dead-eyed expressionless. And then their feet, yeah. Kitty, turn the... Can, yeah, they are rocking. They are really rocking. That's one rowdy crowd, Chris. That's about as rowdy as it gets, though, but that's the best part. I mean, yeah, that's it. See, look at it. A lot of movement, no expression. A lot of movement, dead. Yeah, they... But these guys, they're not even mentally present. They're just all dressed the same. It's such a fascinating part of the culture. Uh, Yeah, I've never noticed that before, but you're right. They don't seem to be having a good time. It doesn't look like anyone's having a good time, but their feet say they are. The, 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 the disparity between the two regions of the body is fascinating to me. Cliff had one song. He goes, we got to modern, modernize our sound a little bit. So we worked up a polka of 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I remember it just didn't seem to work musically on the, on the accordion. And yet, you're and yet out, you're sometimes, the, you gotta go back. sometimes the crowds would kind of go a little nutty for that one because I think they were used to hearing songs like Musica Musica, all these classic polka numbers, and we would play Space Space Odyssey or 2001, and they would go, whoa, this is pretty cutting edge. That's fantastic. Now, <laughs> see, I think you need to go back to your polka roots. I think you need to go back to your roots. Who are just a couple of uh, bands that you produced over the years that you really, maybe they didn't hit it as big, but you always think like, oh, but that was a really great band, or they're really special? Oh, I love Freddy Johnston. I produced, um, uh, I've known him for a long time. I actually have a side band with him, uh, the Not All Boyfriends. We play covers every now and then. Did you produce Bad Reputation? I did, yes. I fucking love that song. Yeah, this, that, the record is This Perfect World. Yes. All the song, the songwriting is just uh, so... Brilliant. He, he, it's like every song is like a little Cormac McCarthy novel. Just you can sort of see the landscape. Who's and, still alive, by the way? Yes. He did not die. Incorrect report from yes. USA Today. And uh, also another band um, who I'm very close with, uh, Against Me. I did two records mm-hmm. with uh, with uh, Against Me, and and I, you know, I, when I made their their first record, the first record I made with them, New Wave, I thought they're like the Clash. They're going to set the world on fire, and and they never really took off at um, Alternative Radio. They have a huge following. I mean, they when you see them play shows, the crowd, their, their fans sing every song at the top of their lungs. And I, I love them. I love Laura Jane Grace and, uh, and the band. They're, they're incredible. Uh, what is it, how many elements need to come together for a hit? Because it's obviously, obviously the music has to be good or it has to be, it has to have, it has to have, some, have some sort of sticky element to it. But it feels like, Oh, there's so many other things. There's timing, and there's if it catches the right promotion, or if it gets to the right person. I mean, like, is there a is there a consistent thing that you've seen? Like, oh, they had you know five of the six things you need for this to work. God, I w- I w- if I knew, if I had a formula like that, I could figure that out. I would love that. Well, uh, even if you could, it still doesn't mean you can control it. It's like you can't. It's just like if you're making you know internet content, you can't control the viral quality of something. You you get you just never know yeah. that part of it, but there must there must be other factors. I mean, for me personally, it's still the human connection with what the human voice sounds like. Um, if if the singing and the lyrics are right, you know, the the beat has got to be one thing, of course, and a great guitar riff or whatever it is, other hooks in the song. But to to me, the thing that really makes a great song is that the human element of uh, the vocalist and the and the lyrics and the singing. And if you could strip all the you know, do you do you ever strip all the music part away and just sort of focus in on that and go, okay, if this works, then we can figure out the other instrumentation? Yeah, I mean, a good song, in theory, you can change the arrangement. It, it doesn't need to have uh, whatever whatever arrangement you come up with. If the song is good, you can probably change it, and the song is still going to be good. But the opposite is not the same. If, this, if a song is a turd, you can polish it and polish it, <laughs> and it's still going to be a turd. It's just not going to be a great song. Because you've you know? remixed a lot of stuff, too. I have, yeah. Do you like that process of taking a finished thing and being like, well, what else can we do with this? You know, that's how Garbage started, really. Duke and Steve and I started doing remixes for House of Pain and U2 and Depeche Mode and Nine Inch Nails and whatever. And it was fun. It set the template for Garbage because we would get a, a tape in, but like it used to be a 24-track tape, and we would erase everything except for the lead vocal and then record all new instrumentation. And sometimes take the vocals and, and change the timing or the pitch or run it through samplers. And 
and it was fun. And th- and I never got asked to do club mixes. So I was just making remixes and and sort of doing whatever I wanted. And they seem people seemed to like them. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we kept getting offers to do them. And um, and that was the template for garbage. At one point, Duke and Steve and I were like, "This is fun. We should maybe sort of use this idea to." start a band yeah because at that time that cd singles were pretty big or or and you would get you know oh you'd buy this track and here's five mixes five remixes yeah for a while it it was cool and then it it became a little annoying because every time you put up like in garbage we put a a single out and they'd say well we need like four remixes and and again they're recoupable right (laughs) Uh, right (laughs) you know unless we do it and usually we at that point we didn't have time because we were on tour but um it and then we also found it kind of annoying because at least over in the UK and sometimes over in Europe uh, they would count they would put the single out and then put like three different formats out and they counted them all as one sale so if you sold if you wanted to get the garbage single with all six remixes you had to buy three three CDs maybe they were only 99p but they had to buy all three and then but then that counted for three units sold oh gotcha so that was like how they got they wanted to get the chart positions higher. Got it. Mm. Got it. Anyway. Oh, very sneaky. Yeah, luckily that doesn't really happen that much anymore. No, well, no, no, we're not a lot a, of CDs being sold. <laughs> we're just a we're just a single culture now. Like it's just singles culture. What did you remix for you too? I did um, Crash Car from uh, what was the name of the record? Uh, it had this the single Lemon on it. Oh, that was um, Pop. Pop, Pop Mart. Pop, Pop Mart. No, not not Pop Mart. No, it was, wasn't it, was it before that? Oh, I'm Zoo. thinking of the Giant Lemon. Was it Zuropa? Zero- yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And a Crash Car and a Dirty Day. Nice. And it was it was cool. We we took uh, I brought in a violin player, put some strings on one of the tracks, and. Another one, we just sort of uh, put all this uh, really trashy percussion and stuff on. And, um, and, and and sometimes they work. Sometimes, you know, a lot of people don't like remixes because you're messing with... A lot of fans don't always like remixes because you're messing with the original. Yeah. And to me, if, if a song... Like I said, if a song is good, you can strip it down and hopefully it's still going to be able to interpret well, are you it in work, a new it's way. Like, are you working with, you know, for instance, Bono in that case? Or is the label just go, here you go. Do you, do you not even deal with the original... Do you not even deal with the band? Sometimes they just send us the, the 24 tracks and say, do your thing. And sometimes we would get a call and it, it, that we would talk to the band. Occasionally they would come into the studio or their manager, someone from the label would come in. But usually they would just kind of leave us alone and they might give us a little direction, but usually they're just looking for something different. Yeah. I was... Uh, did we talk about the Morrissey thing on the podcast yet? The Morrissey thing about when he was on The Tonight Show. <laughs> Which Morrissey thing? Yes, I believe yeah. we did. Teresa. Carson, we were talking about how Carson was bombing. About yes, with Dana, Dana Carvey. Oh, with yeah. Dana, that's right. I was just so... F- I still cannot get over the fact that he was selling out arenas and could not get airplay back back in those days. Like, what do you think is such a... What? I mean, yeah, no, I mean, that, 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 that kind of happens sometimes. It's crazy. But now, you have, like, radio play isn't even really a... Is it even still a factor? A little bit. I think radio play really uh, factors if you're factors more into like pop stars and big R and B artists and, and and some of the bigger hip hop acts. Um, you know, a lot of the like Katy Perry and Rihanna, they still rely on top forty radio and and the, the, their labels, the gatekeepers will. You know, they sort of follow that old model. You got to be in every magazine you can. You, you want get as much publicity as you can. We got to be in radio. We got to do TV appearances, and, and ultimately, that still does seep into the culture. Now, whether it helps sell more records is dubious. You know, they they probably sell some records, but not nearly what they used to sell for what they spend on it. And garbage. How was your tour last year? It was great. We did. Uh, it was our twentieth anniversary right. for for the debut record, and uh, we played. The entire record, all the songs, which we did when it came out 20 years ago, but we also worked up all of the B-sides. Oh, and, cool. Uh, some of them were pretty weird B-sides, <laughs> and we'd never played them before. And uh, so that it took us a couple weeks of rehearsal to t- try and figure out how to do it, but it was really fun. We only did, we decided we were only going to do like 30 shows. We didn't want to um, uh, do that and just keep running that into the ground. There's, a, there's a few fun. garbage tracks on Rocksmith. Which is the video game where you actually plug in your guitar? Oh, you and play, play yeah. and actually play. It's I, I think they're great. They're great fun. They're fun <laughs> to play. They got some good. There's really good hooks, and some heavy stretches. How big are the fucking hands? Like, cause I have I got like a seven fret reach, and I'm like, this hurts. 
It's all magic in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how the fuck are you actually playing this? <laughs> Do you think you guys are going to tour again anytime soon? Yeah, we're we're you know, Strange Little Birds just came out and has done gotten a really. Uh, been really well critically received and uh we're doing shows through the year into the fall um and we're already talking about doing another record um i probably won't record it till sometime later next year but we're um you know i i think as a band we're uh we, we're still enjoying each other's company and that's what allows us to keep going really yeah i mean i would imagine at a certain point no matter how much money or no matter how much of anything you really do spend a lot of time with other people and you probably should <laughs> enjoy it. it should probably be fun yeah yeah i mean i know a lot of bands who don't even speak to each other and and yet yeah. they have had successful careers so, such a uh, crazy speaking of music documentaries did you see the one on the ramones it, it's oh, it's fantastic one, yeah. um johnny stole joey's girlfriend and they didn't speak for like 20 years <laughs> didn't say one word to each other and yet they kept touring and putting records out. And wow, you know, they, uh, Joey wrote the song "The KKK Took My Baby Away." That was right. written about Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but I guess you could just stand next to someone and play, I suppose, and then just like walk off opposite sides of the stage. Yeah, a lot of bands do that. It's a, it's a job, I guess, to a certain extent. Well, that's what the uh, Mamas and the Papas. I saw her again last night. Uh, was written about uh, Denny sleeping with Michelle. So John wrote that song, so they'd have to sing it on stage, which oh. is about Denny sleeping with See, Michelle. See, that's great. That's that's yeah. the kind of stuff I like getting out of documentaries yeah. when, you, when you hear those I stories. I still think the, the, you know, it was, I, I wish it had been longer, but the Fleetwood Mac behind the music is fucking amazing. Like, that should be a scripted movie, just all the craziness that was happening in that in that band at the time. Well, you also get out of the Tom Petty documentaries that uh, Stevie Nicks really wanted to leave Fleetwood Mac and go to Tom Petty <laughs> and be in the Heartbreakers. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holy shit! You know, Steve, <laughs> Stevie came into the studio when we were doing the Sound City film, which is another great documentary. And she is badass. She is so cool. She's just funny and disarming and just sits down and there's no bullshit. And yet she's Stevie Nicks. And then she went in to sing and her voice just sounds amazing. Mm. And uh, so that was a really cool, that was a special, that was a special session. It's really cool. Do you have like one or two like things like that, like the Stevie Nicks session where you go, I can't believe I'm doing this right now. <laughs> well, the same Sound City, Paul McCartney came in to uh, this the Foo Studio 606 and his handlers or his assistants made sure everything was set up, and we didn't know what, what was going to happen. They were just going to jam and write a song together. So we had the piano ready, the organ ready. There were a couple of guitar rigs, bass drums, percussion. Everything was ready. And um, Paul came in and just sat down in the control room and started chatting, and we just hung out for like three hours, and we kept asking him stories. When he were in Africa, what was it like making Band on the Run? And, and he's, oh, it was, he's just lovely. He's just he, He's so cool, man. And it was totally disarming. And then I, I think I finally went, you know, why don't we think about trying to record here? And they go, oh, yes, let's let's go try to record. And, and Paul said, what's this? And he picked up this little matchbox guitar that was sitting in the corner. We're like, oh, my God, he's picking up the one thing and we're not set up to record. <laughs> anyway, and he just went and plugged it into an amp and started doing this jamming. And Chris picked up the bass, started playing, and Dave jumped on the drums. And I sat up behind the Neve console and... He said, Butch, is my mic working? And I remember looking out in the studio and went, holy fucking shit, it's Paul McCartney. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't be swearing. <laughs> no, you can swear. <laughs> no, you can't yeah. swear. And in my head, I'm, I'm going, yeah, your mic's working. And in my head going, holy shit, it's Paul McCartney. <laughs> holy shit, it's Paul McCartney. And then he started singing. I was just going, like, the hair in the back of my neck came up. And I was like, holy shit, it's Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I'm trying sorry, to be I cool. I forgot to record that, Paul. Uh, I was, I was yeah. just trying to, trying to keep it together. But he is he just was fantastic, really, really awesome. Awesome to meet him. Is there anything you want to promote before we let you go? Is there anything you want well, to... Well, there's a new garbage record, Did, Chris. Besides the garbage record, is there anything else you want to talk about? Mm, no, I mean, we're, uh, we're, we'll be touring Strange Little Birds this year. Um, and I think I mentioned... Um, uh, Wendy Schneider has done a documentary, The Smart Studio Story, on, on Steve and my studio back in the Midwest. And that's coming out in the fall. We're still, we just, like I said, we got to get the, all the licensing for the music cleared. And, and uh, it, it's, she's done a really good job with the film. If you're a fan of um, 
you know, 90s alternative music and how the underground sort of came into the, to, to the mainstream. It's, I think you'll, you'll think you'll enjoy it. Oh, listen, I still listen to Lithium all the time. It's a great station. It's like a Lithium. Yeah, it's fucking great. Listen to the Sirius XM. I'm sometimes, still... they, sometimes they throw me a curveball when they're playing Dave Matthews. And I go, really, Lithium? This is weird that you would... <laughs> But Under the Table and Dreaming did enter in. It did, yeah. It did, yeah. It did veer into that a little bit. Did you ever work with Dave Matthews? He's a big Dave Matthews. No, I do. I love Dave Matthews. I have met him a couple times. I was going to work with him on a film, and he wrote some brilliant songs for it. Uh, and then it went in one of those things where it got flipped from CA to another agency, William Morris, and then it went into Turnaround and whatever. They all, a lot of great actors were attached to it, and it was sort of ready to go. And then got put on, like a lot of movies, got put on hold. Who but was attached to it? Do you remember? I, I probably shouldn't even say I don't want to get into <laughs> any trouble. I don't know the legal ramifications. But but I, I had never met Dave before. And I was doing something with Garbage. And the, one of the producers and director f- flew me back uh, to L.A. to go see him at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, I was at that show. And I had never seen him before, and so I go in the Hollywood Bowl, and I'm looking around going, wow, there's like 7,000 gorgeous hippie chicks here all dancing. (laughs) And it was totally true. He's like their Pied Piper. And they were going, hey, hey, man, you want some wine? I'm like, sure. And, 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 And... and so, and and, uh, and and it was a really good show, even though I didn't know, I only knew a handful of the yeah. songs. Um, but he, it, I went backstage to meet him, and um, and he was really lovely. I'm talking to him, like I'm just talking to you here, Chris, and I saw out of the corner of my eye this, um, like something, and then I go, wow, this, there's a woman here, and she's, there's something quite remarkable. And he goes, hey, Butch, this is Julie, and I turn, it was Julia Roberts about this far away. <laughs> she goes, hi, Butch, I, I love garbage, it's really nice to meet you. And I'm like, holy shit, it's Julia Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> had another had another one of those moments. <laughs> and then finally, in conclusion, did you ever meet up with Clive Davis again and say, do you remember when you came to Madison that time? I, I never have. I've been to a couple of Clive's um, pre-Grammy party things, yeah. but I never, you know, it's just, there's just a lot of musicians and people in the room. I never got a chance to talk to him again. But w- if I do, I will definitely tell him that story. I'm sure he won't remember it. Maybe he will, though. No, he'll, was, remember being he'll remember on getting fire. pulled over on, yeah. the, on the car because the car started on fire and he had to get out and stand on the Interstate 90 while, uh, <laughs> while they got another car to pick that. him up. I almost died and it was for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Clive Davis, if you're listening, it's not too late. Yeah, and hey, I could have worked with Mutt Lang. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> I guess everything else worked out okay. Everything <laughs> seems fine. You're such a nice, lovely guy. Really, honestly, thank you so much. And if you guys play in Los Angeles again, the lot when you guys, I think you played the Greek last year, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, I was out of town performing, and I couldn't go, and I really wanted to go. So if you play Los Angeles again, we'll get you hooked up. I, th- I think we're playing in the fall. I don't know the exact dates yet, but we're probably going to play somewhere here, like in October or November. Fantastic. Thank you, Butch Vig. Thank you, gentlemen. It was enjoy fun. Your, enjoy your burrito, everyone. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. This episode of the Nerdist Podcast brought to you by CISO, the all-comedy ad-free streaming TV service made for serious comedy nerds. Uh, if you love Community or Rick and Morty, then you have to watch CISO's new original series, Harmon Quest, uh, which was just at Comic-Con last night at the Balboa Theater. I believe they maybe did some Harmon Questing. Uh, but it's a, an improv animated live action journey, and it's, uh, it's all RPG stuff. Uh, Dan Harmon is there. He has uh, Spencer Crittenden, Aaron McGathy, Jeff B. Davis, and, and a lot of amazing guest stars like Aubrey Plaza and Tom Middleditch and Steve Agee and Paul F. Tompkins and Ron Funches. So go check it out. Uh, you can watch every episode of Harmon Quest on CISO along with a billion other comedy things that you will love. Use the promo code Harmon Quest to get two months free. Uh, that is an extra month on top of the already free trial month. So go check out CISO and thanks for sponsoring this episode of the Nerdist Podcast.